Hello, welcome back to that Adumbala Vlogs. Today we are going to discuss a book that I've recently read and I'm extremely excited to be sharing the excerpts of this book with you all. Now, the name of the book is Why We Sleep and the author's name is Matthew Walker. Matt is an English scientist and he's a professor of neuroscience and psychology at the University of California, Berkeley. Now, what is interesting about Matt is he spent most of his academic life really researching and talking about science. So we are hearing from a, a well-known scientist who's dedicated most of his life to analyzing sleep. Now, why did I get to read this book, Why We Sleep? It's, it's a question I've often asked myself when I've got too much work to do and I just don't have enough time or uh, enough hours in a day. We often, often think, oh, why is this thing taking eight hours of the day? Why do we even need to sleep? And as of age and as we grow older, I think we realize food, um, sleep and the need to breathe are basically what's keeping us alive. So let's start focusing and understanding what is sleep, why we need it and what can we do to get a better night's rest so that we can have a much more productive day ahead. Let's get started. So before we get into what we learned from this book and what the key insights are, let's first get into the nature of this book. Is it worth reading it? So essentially, it is a heavy read. I wouldn't say it's been one of the easiest reads, especially when he gets to the sciencey bits and he talks about all these neurochemicals and all those impacts. I did find, or find it a bit of a heavy read, especially it took me back to the days uh, when I used to, uh, it took me back to the days when I was, uh, say, reading a science uh, science novel or, or say uh, I was reading the notes on biology or chemistry or physics. Um, wasn't very interested in it but I, I, I'll keep that to a bare minimum and for those who are very sciencey sciencey people I will throw in a little bit of nuggets that I can still remember. Now in terms of reading the book it was quite a heavy read for me because I don't come from a scientific background I was reading it mainly from you know just why did I want to read this book is how can I make my own life better how can I make this this thing that I invest eight hours of my day in? how can I make it better. So this book took me about two to three days of uh, physical read. I obviously read it on my Kindle, but um, heavy read at, at some times. But what was great is this is the only book where the author actually has starts this book with, if you fall asleep while reading this book, he's not going to mind. So I, I didn't really mind. It's If anyone who's suffering from insomnia, please write the sciencey bits in this book because nothing made a lot of sense to me. The way this book is being structured is quite easy to follow and you can flip flop between different parts to see whatever interests you. So the first part is called this thing called sleep. The part two of this book is how the, the book has been titled, which is why should you sleep? Part three is the interesting book, which talks about how and why we dream. Now we all dream, but this talks about the scientific reason and why dreaming is important. And the last part is where he says that we are currently living in the society where we are depend high dependence on chemicals. So part four is very aptly titled from sleeping pills to a society transformed. As Matt mentions in part one, what is this thing called sleep? It just doesn't make sleeping just doesn't make sense. In today's world, if you're extremely productive, you want to get every minute's worth out, which is a, which is a typical me. Um, it just doesn't make sense. You're wasting eight hours of sleep. Why do I need to sleep? And you would have heard statements like, I'll sleep when I die. Um, I think what Matt comes back is from a scientific backing point of view, if you don't sleep, you are going to die. So it is sleeping, eating and breathing are the three main things that are keeping us alive. So what he talks about in part one is if you look at it, yes, sleep is a very weird thing. It does. It's evolutionary. It doesn't make sense. You're out cold for eight hours of the day eight hours of the night, any wild animal could just pounce on you and eat you. So even, even it doesn't make sense evolutionary, but even today's world in productivity, it doesn't make a lot of sense to sleep for eight hours of, 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 of the night. You could be getting so much fun done. Um, so why do we sleep? Now, eight hours per night is actually important because it's your body's internal reset. And if you don't get eight hours of eight hours of sleep, there is so much that can impact your body. There are cancer, heart attacks, mental diseases, Alzheimer's, shorter life, you name it. And, and you know, it, having lack of sleep has shown to have impact on all these medical illnesses. What can you do? So eight hours of sleep is recommended per night. But again, that's a ballpark figure which an average adult needs. You may need, you personally may need more than eight hours or less than eight hours. That's completely bespoke to you. Now, there are people and there is this 1% of people in the world who can get by with four to six hours of sleep. 
unless you've been proven medically that you can get by with four hours of sleep, assume you're not part of that 1%. So you need to crack in eight hours of proper sleep. Now, when he uses the word proper sleep, he also does say that, and I was shocked to see the statistics, two thirds of adults across the world do not get adequate sleep. Two thirds, that is a huge number. And is it something to do with today's society? Is it something about with all of us being in the rut that's causing this? I don't know, but I was a bit blown away when I read two thirds of adults don't get recommended eight hours of sleep. Then he goes on to expand that the consequences of not getting eight hours of sleep is, as I mentioned, you could be pre-diabetic, cardiovascular diseases, there's psychiatric conditions, there's depression, there's anxiety, there's also dependence on caffeine that increases. And why that resonated so much with me is I am, I love to start my day with a hot cup of coffee. And, and even now as I'm talking, I've got a cup of coffee, which I'm going to keep sideways because that's what it comes down to is humans are the only mammalian species that consciously derive ourselves out of sleep. Now, I live with three dogs and I can attest to the fact that the, they, they play. The first thing that they do whenever they're tired is they just sit and they sleep. Whereas what is the first thing we'll do? Oh, after a long lunch or after something, all I want to do is just get my cup of coffee because I'm feeling sleepy. I don't acknowledge what my body is trying to tell me. We all are guilty of this. We've all pulled one-nighters. We've all pulled, um, you know, pull, pull, you know, stayed up all night either to party or study or maybe one meeting or, or something. We've all we've all tormented our body by giving it less sleep. Now, now coming to the sciencey bits of it, there has been ongoing research on this topic. And what the first, very first outcomes of the research was, um, there is a, a solar clock. So the most reliable thing in this world is you can always, always bet on the fact that the sun will rise and the sun will set. So that's, that's how we get our 24 hour clock and we get our solar calendar, um, which is what our, 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 our clocks are based on. Similarly, body also has a clock and we've called it the circadian rhythm or the circadian clock. Very interestingly, and with all the research that was done, it is not really linked to the solar clock. Uh, our body clock is also very close to 24 hours. I think he mentioned our circadian clock uh, without any external inter inter interactions is 24 hours and 50 minutes in humans, give or take a couple of hours. So scientifically, how the circadian clock works is there are chemicals with buildup. So you've heard of, of, uh, of, of serotonin, and you've heard of melatonin and a lot of people take melatonin tablets and how the sleep pressure works. You've had a brilliant night's sleep and um, you've just woken up fresh. Your adenosine level in your, in your body is at its lowest. The, the more number of hours you've been awake, the adenosine level in your body increases. And that's what is your sleep pressure point. So the longer you've stayed awake without any external influences, the pressure to sleep, don't like when you've had a really hard day of work, you've worked really hard and your adenosine level is really high. You will say, all I want to do is just crash on my bed and sleeping. That's what is called the pressure valve. That's your adenosine in your body, putting that pressure on your eyelids to say, go off to sleep. A lot of the sleep pressure is then impacted by an external thing called caffeine. So every time we are dunking at that coffee or tea, everything has a bit of uh, caffeine. And I'll come back to what all has caffeine, but what caffeine does is it's a psychoactive stimulant. And rather than stopping that adenosine from reacting into your body, it goes and caffeine goes and attaches itself to all the neurotransmitters. So there is adenosine building up, but then what caffeine does it, it closes all the entry points so that your body doesn't recognize the increasing adenosine level. So it's the caffeine is basically acting as a gateway between the adenosine and your neurotransmitters. So it's not that caffeine is solving a problem, it's just it's just delayed, delaying the problem. So once your caffeine level decreases in the body, that's why you get something called a caffeine crash. And how do you fix that? By having another cup of coffee. So as you can see, we are in the circular loop of, of coffee, not giving ourselves enough rest, caffeine, caffeine, caffeine. Decaf and where, okay, now let's take back what was my shocking points. So the first shocking bit was caffeine is not the solution. Have you seen days where you've slept really well and you may actually be able to function without a coffee? And I haven't had days like that. I'd love to have a day like that. So I'm gonna, I'm, that's something on my radar I'm going to try. 
The second thing that shocked me is what drinks have caffeine. Energy drinks have caffeine. Soft drinks have caffeine. So if you look at everything, if you just tilt the product, there is coffee, literally caffeine in almost some of the medications also we take. I was just gobsmacked by what, what, what stuff in this world that we are putting into our bodies has caffeine. So if you think you're going to go on this detox caffeine, I'm going to get rid of caffeine from my body. Be very careful. There's caffeine in almost everything you touch. The second thing that was shocked is decaf. Now I always had this, I knew decaf had a little bit of coffee, but even if you have four or five, but you know, mathematically, I never put this into context. If you have three to four decafs, it's like having one full cup of coffee. And even if you have a, a decaf at say 3 p.m., you're gonna have that amount of caffeine in your body. So if you really wanna go caffeine and get rid of caffeine from your body, it has to be cold turkey. Just get rid of any source of caffeine. Ah, uh, harder than it sounds. Then in part one, what Matt also does, he addresses this whole thing of, um, it is not mathematical, it's not like a bank. If you robbed yourself of eight hours of sleep in one night, and if you sleep the next day, say about 16 hours, you're not gonna make up for that sleep. It, it's, not, it's, not, it's not an accrual-based system as accountants would love to think. It is, think of it like time. If you've lost it, you've lost it. It's, it's gonna be very hard. So I am again guilty of this because what we usually do is we don't get a lot of sleep. We get about four to six hours of sleep on the weekdays, for example, and I sleep in on weekend. Now, when you do that, yes, you're addressing the total hours problem mathematically, but you're, you're not doing your body any favor because the body wouldn't be able to catch up. So think of it as just because your system needs to flush out, you are running with that toxin in your body because you haven't given it adequate rest. So that's again another thing which I was pretty shocked to hear. I said, because we all function in that way, you know, okay, we'll, we'll sleep over the weekend, which is what we do. We, we have late starts on weekends. The other thing was melatonin. Now, I didn't know what melatonin did, but I had seen a lot of my friends when they, when they went overseas, came back and they had to deal with jet lag. They would just pop in a melatonin pill and say, okay, I can go off to sleep. Now, what melatonin does is think of it as you're running in a race, but melatonin is the whistle guy who says, yes, your race can begin. So that's all the hormone does. It doesn't put you to sleep. It just tells your body to start down the shutting system so that you can start the process of sleep. Again, it's just impressive how, how amazing this body is, whether you believe in the whole creator system or not. It's just an amazing feat of mechanics that this body is able to independently, you know, have these pressure gauge systems in the body, have these neurons and hormones telling us what is the right time to sleep. And if you just do a simple thing, listen to your body, I think there's so much, so much you can gain out of it. Then he talks about it's not just the quantity of sleep, it's also the quality of sleep. And then sleep is, we've heard of these terms called REM, non-REM. So REM is rapid eye movement, which is um, where you get your deep sleep, which is where you go into your dream phase. But NREM sleep or non-REM sleep is also very important to get into that conscious phase of, of, of getting proper adequate sleep. Now, what I realized was it's not important. So it's not just quantity, it is quality. But it's never quality over quantity because you need that sufficient quantity so that your body can go into the cycles of REM sleep and end REM sleep. Which then takes us into the part where he talks about dreaming, what, what happens in that dream phase. Now think of it, think of what is dreams, why do we dream? I've always been very um, intrigued about this. And he summarizes this in a very, very easy fashion. Think of dream or think of sleep as your daily night windscreen wiper. You collect all this dust in your life throughout the day and what sleep does is it gives you a clean slate but it also solidifies it into, into memory. Um, when I was explaining this book um, to Siva and he comes from a very IT testy background so he's, he understands the concept and he says, so it's a virtual reality test space. And I said, yeah, dreams are literally where you can play out your scenarios and have no consequences. And you know, there are these statements, I wouldn't even dream of hurting you. There's nothing wrong in dreaming it as long as you don't do it because it's a consequence space, um, free space. And um, dreams only come in REM sleep. So when you're in deep sleep, you when you're in REM, so think of dreams as a byproduct of REM. So if you're in REM, that means you've had dreams. So when you wake up and you can remember a dream, that means you can be rest assured you've had a good night's rest. Not Not always, but again. The thing about when they've tracked dreams and where they analyze dreams, it's not coherent. It's not, think of your brain trying to sort files out, but in no random order. So you could, you don't have any control over what you dream. However, dreams do have a function. 
It is the only time in your whole day when you sleep, your prefrontal cortex, which is the main decision-making part of your brain, does shut down. Now, because your prefrontal cortex shuts down, think of it uh, as um, kids having fun when the parents are away. So there's no prefrontal cortex calling the shots. So they're kids who can do what they want. They can break the house down. But as soon as the parents are going to come back, it resets itself. So the house looks as if nothing has gone wrong, nothing has been broken. So that's what your dreams are. Now, dreams do help in the following factors. It, it increases your creativity. It's an overnight therapy. It takes the edge off, you know, when you say, I have a problem, I'm going to sleep over it. It's because you're giving your brain that time to heal, the time to think about it. Also learning, we've heard of Albert Einstein or even Newton, they've, they've solved complex problems in their sleep. What the brain does, it constantly mulls over the problem. And because all you're doing is doing nothing but just thinking about the problem, you automatically get that solution. So dreaming is great. Dreaming about problems, sometimes you can also get a solution in your dream. So it's the content of the dream that really matters, which solidifies that learning. Now, th now that about the sciencey jargon of what happens in your dream is when you're in a dream stage and people have scanned the brain and there's been immense amount of research that's been done there is a cocktail of chemicals in the brain when you're awake the brain still has a logical sense that it's going in it is the only time that no adrenaline or no the adrenaline in uh, equivalent in the brain which is i think called neoepiphrine if there's some medical person please tell me how to pronounce it but i think it's called neoepiphrine in the brain it's the only time the brain doesn't have access to this chemical which what it does is it channelizes and focuses your brain on solving that one thing that you're dreaming about so which is what enhances and gets you that's that's that solution of to a problem in your dreams so that can kind of summarizes the whole book which is why we sleep why this is so important why should we try and give up caffeine but now let's try and summarize this in my six key takeaways that I have from this book. And I'm also going to bust a few myths that I personally was surprised to learn in this book. So first, why did I read this book? I mainly read this book to see if I could get any snippets on how could I improve my life, improve my sleep and then increase my productivity. So the six key takeaways that I had. Number one, stop the dependence on caffeine. I mentioned this. This is the biggest takeaway from me is just learning the half-life of caffeine is about three to four hours so even at 3 p.m if i have it I, I think it's just blown my mind i don't know how you feel about it but i think that's my one key takeaway is in order to get a good night's rest and get a proper sleep i need to take i need to time my caffeine and and hopefully get rid of this uh, dependency on caffeine number two key takeaway is have a set schedule so when you have a, a, a proper time to sleep proper time to wake up your body gets used to it and and I know with, by raising dogs, having a routine, having that discipline of having, uh, having time, time, everything should be done at its proper time, has a significant influence on, on um, just getting that set routine. Where possible, number three, where possible, please don't use alarm clocks. Now, this is harder for me, but if I, if I need my eight hours of sleep, if I start bringing my time ahead and let's say I, uh, for some reason I can get to bed at seven and go off to sleep, I will automatically get up when my when I'm fully rested. The body will wake me up. So, what alarm does is it's a it's an extremely stressful way of waking up every day. You may be in your REM sleep when your alarm hits you, and you'll actually be more tired than when you went off to sleep because you're being jolted out of this of this beautiful amount of, of limited amount of quality sleep that you are getting. So try and not use alarm clocks because your circadian rhythm is very different from your time or solar solar calendar solar timing. So if possible, don't don't keep set an alarm and also try and keep your routine with the sun. What this means is if you are trying to sleep with the sun and get up with the sun, you are aligning your circadian rhythm with the whole solar sun, the, the state of the sun, uh, with the whole um, rhythm of the sun. Um, the next key takeaway was um, he does talk about alcohol and dependency on alcohol. What is interesting is alcohol is said to be a sedative. So the more alcohol you drink, the less uh, quality sleep you're going to get. Because rather than it putting you into a sleep state, it's putting you into a sedative sleep where you're not going to get your REM, non-REM sleep, which is important as we've just learned to get a good night's rest. Um, the next takeaway for me was napping. Now, 
I'm not a big fan of napping in the afternoon. My husband is a big fan of napping in the afternoon. My dogs will just sleep 16 hours of the day. So I really don't understand these. And, and, and think about it, if you've, if you've done a very good quality sleep, you're gonna find it harder to sleep at night. And then what Matt also talks about napping is, is it, so there is, a, there is a question, if you need to get eight hours of sleep, should I not just do four hours and four hours when I get the time? Humans are not designed to sleep in that format. As we know, we need to have certain amounts of REM, non-REM sleep to, to get to feel properly rested. So we can sleep biphasically rather than monophasically, but then it needs to be timed. If you can't have a four hour, four hour, you need to time yourself. And, and if you can avoid, if you can avoid naps, um, as, as we initially said, a hormone called adenosine needs to build enough so that it causes the pre to, to cause the sleep pressure. Now, if you're releasing a bit of that adenosine pressure, you're not going to fall asleep. So you're going to delay that whole cycle. So if you can, till you reset your clock, it is good to avoid naps so that you then yourself will know how your, how your sleeping pattern is. Do not, do not, do not rely on sleeping pills. He's dedicated a whole part to it on sleeping pills and why the dependency um, is really causing more harm than good. And we, we as a society must stop appreciating people who are just pulling themselves along on caffeine and not sleeping properly. I think we need to encourage people and we need to make this a better world for creative people, for thinking people where you're well rested is when you're going to make better cognitive decisions, which is where we can all get better as a society. So again, I think one of the last things why I wanted to save the best for the last is we need to stop this dependency on, on sleeping pills and all these other fancy things. If you're tired enough, like a child, you'll just hit the bed and go to sleep. It's as simple as that. Listen to your body. Again, there are medical conditions. I, I do un, un, acknowledge and accept that there are medical conditions like insomnia, etc., out there. So those are my key takeaways from Matt's book on why we sleep. So I think I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit more informed. I'm a bit more educated. I have started taking my sleep very seriously. And one key lifestyle change that I've made is instead of setting my alarms to wake up in the morning, I've been setting my alarms to go to sleep. So hopefully you found this book summary of why we sleep as useful as I found it and you'll also make some changes. If you resonated with anything and you're going to try it out, leave it in your comments below. And if you found this helpful, please don't forget to like, share, subscribe and tell your friends to smash that subscribe button. Till then, thank you so much for watching. Signing off, this is Divya and there's Deradun Bala as well.